everyone. Uh, we're going to wait for everyone to get settled just a couple of minutes so we can start our event. Um, I see that there's a lot of excitement here, so that's great. Thank you to everyone for showing up despite the weather. Um, so yeah. Okay, so hi, hello and welcome to Politics and Prose. My name is Isa and I am the Subscriptions Coordinator um, where we now host um, in-person and virtual events along with trips and classes. And you can find out more about this on our website at www.politics-prose.com. So before we get into the readings, um, I'd like to do some housekeeping. Uh, I'd like to remind everyone to please keep your cell phones and other devices silent just so to avoid disrupting the event. And second, when we get the time to opening the floor to your questions, please speak into the microphone over there by that pillar so everyone can hear it. And we will be live streaming this event. So if you have any friends who couldn't make it, it will be up on our um, YouTube channel. Um, following the Q&A, we will have a signing over here at this table. So if you have not already bought the book, we have copies behind the registers at the front of the store. We will ask you to line up starting at that pillar and we will come by to ask your name for personalization. Once the event is complete, we kindly ask that you please fold up your chairs and lean them against something sturdy. So now, without further ado, I'm excited to welcome David Keplinger to discuss his new poetry collection, Ice. Um, <laughs> I am asking how much more I have to learn from this, Keplinger writes. You are asking that same question. In these poems, he turns to our predecessors for guidance in picking apart the forces that govern modernity, masculinity, power, knowledge, conquest. With each comes a critique of the Anthropocene, our drive to possess the unpossessable, and with each comes also the discovery of what and who we've harmed in the discovering. Ice shelves, ice shelves collapse, climate change melts layers of permafrost to reveal a severe wolf's head, a pair of grease smudged reading glasses calls up a mother's phantom. So is there a point to all this singing? Our ancestors cannot answer. The wolf's head can't either. But sometimes out of the snow of confusion, something answers, saying gorgeous things like yes. And the flowers open up their small green trumpets anyway. David Keplinger is the author of Ice and Another City. His collections of poetry also include The Most Natural Thing, The Prayers of Others, The Clearing, and The Rose Inside. Keplinger's work has appeared in Poetry, Plowshares, Virginia Quarterly Review, American Poetry Review, and the Writer's Almanac, and has been translated and included in anthologies in China, Germany, Denmark, Northern Ireland, and elsewhere. Currently, Keplinger directs the MFA program at American University in Washington, DC. Everyone, please join me in welcoming David Keplinger to Politics and Prose. Hi, everyone. Oh, it's nice to see so many faces from my life here in Washington. And just a couple people to thank. Uh, Patricia Corral isn't here today, but she helped to organize this. Yeah. She helped to organize this event. Uh, I'm very grateful for her. And Chloe Yelena Miller uh, did a class on uh, a couple of my books this week uh, here at Politics and Prose, which I heard went really well. And it was very strange to be at home vacuuming while uh, people were talking about my poetry somewhere else. <laughs> Maybe I'll just pretend that's happening all the time. <laughs> so uh, this book is, is called Ice and about, well, I, it, at the beginning of August on the, the release date of, of the book, the Post ran a story that some of you might be familiar with about a roundworm a nematode that was discovered in a block of permafrost that was 46,000 years old. And uh, it came back to life. It thawed and came back to life. Uh, and it began to reproduce uh, and then died after reproducing. But the amazing thing about this nematode is that it lived on both sides of, of history, as it were. It was alive while Neanderthals were walking the earth along with Homo sapiens, and it woke up again in a lab in 2023. So I, I, I thought it was, it was kind of fitting that on the release date of this book, that story should be released from, from the post. 
because that is in fact what inspired this book. Events like that uh, were uh, what I first began to notice in 2018, 2019 uh, in Yakutia in uh, a region of Siberia permafrost was melting at such a rate that the bodies of 40,000 year old, 50,000 year old animals from the last ice age were being revealed perfectly preserved just as they were um, all those, those years ago. And uh, I, I began to write poems of, uh, in response to that just amazement. And the first poem in the book is the, is the first poem that I, I wrote in response to that experience. So there's, a, there's a, an epigraph from the Siberian times. The severed head of the world's first full-sized Pleistocene wolf was unearthed in the Abyski district in the north of Yakutia, on the shore of the Tiriktyak River. Ice. What I heard is that the locals searching for the mammoth tusk along the Tiriktyak discovered instead the head of a wolf that had been frozen over 40,000 years ago. The tongue hung from its mouth the teeth were terrible, but mostly there. The head alone was the size of a child. When the local people found the full-grown wolf head on the Tirtyak and pulled it like a molar from the sopping, gummy earth and hoisted it, the hardened points of fur cut through the gloves into their hands. On each side of the face, the eye sealed shut. When we read about the story of it together, those were the days when we would stay up all winter in the house writing poems in our icy rooms. You wanted a child. I don't know where that question got buried in my body. The wolf head lived on top of its body in the valley on the river and we cannot know how the head got severed from the heart. The body may have dropped and collapsed into grass roots and larches, or it may have been cut from the wolf, but the head stayed intact as it still is, as it feels that way now, the heft and the size of a child. Cocked sideways in its question on the shoulders of the world. So what that poem describes is uh, a, a wolf head that uh, was extracted from this ice accidentally. Uh, people were out looking for mammoth tux tusks and discovered and said this uh, archaic relic. And then it began happening again and again and again. And so I have a series of poems about the kinds of animals that were being discovered there anything from round worms to giant wolf heads to puppies to, uh, in this case, a, a woolly rhino. And this is called Near Yakutia. Of all the animals who had their turn to remind me this was my doing, I've taken things without impediment. The oldest was the rhino near Yakutia, found in her wool in August when the ice roads became passable. Dredged like a galleon, dry docked in mud, calloused as she wrecked slowly into their hands, then given a name and a body and a weight, a portion of the mass of the planet hanging under pounds of gaseous carbon pluming into air. And she lay still drowning in what was once a riverbed, wet tundra around the time hands were inventing axes 
implements of taking. Let me be taken. Let me know what falling is. Let her thwart my life, this baby, this whelp of the herd, who had somewhere to get to, who had somewhere to get to, who had somewhere to get to, and propelled herself like the ship that passed over Icarus when the sky began to clear as the axe man axed and the ice broke in pieces, unhanding everything. I'll just do one more from this, this first section. I mentioned the puppy. There, there, there was one image that just haunted me, and it was a perfectly preserved dog wolf from 18,000 years ago. Dog wolf because it was hard to tell whether it belonged to the dog family or the wolf family. And I remember reading some years ago an article about the friendly gene that early dogs uh, shared. They would be wolves coming close to the villages and those who survived were the ones who carried this friendly gene. And those, f those dogs with such genes were the ones that we now you know, have domesticated and, and have taken into our homes. But there's another side to that story and it's that the word dog is very difficult to trace back etymologically. There is really no direct line that says, oh, dog came from this source. But some say that it comes from a Lithuanian word, and in fact, in the Yakut language, the word dogor means friend. So this little puppy that was found in the permafrost was called dogor in the Yakut language. And I just think that, that, it, that it's beautiful that, that this could really be one of the first domesticated dogs or dog-like creatures that walked on the earth. This is called the Ice Age Wolf that love is. And this epigraph comes from Smithsonian Magazine. Dogor is an 18,000-year-old pup unearthed in Siberian permafrost, whose name means friend in the Yakut language. You'd grown three weeks into your mouth full of teeth, before your eyes froze shut and then your throat, but now you're thawing, moping again, pretending to be tongue and wet fur and padded feet, my darling whose day has come. From out of your mother you fell into ice at play, in a pocket of snow, pure love that dug deep, as the mama and the others dissolved quickly and the father who'd gone to the important place did not return. It took one night for the world to harden you into a long bewildered thought, but 18,000 years before the ice, like a pipe, like a vein, burst open until I say your full name, Dogor, small bulb that keeps growing new wolf bodies. Dogor, don't harden your eyes and return to the dead. Dogor, don't freeze again. Don't fight me or take flight into a thousand motes of ice. Dogor, don't bite. Remember what you are. Leap into my face. Doze in the crook of my big boned shoulder. Stay, Dogor. So the second section of this book takes the ice metaphor and personalizes it a little bit. As many of us in the room know, in middle age, uh, kind of unexpectedly, memories from childhood can begin to tumble upward and, and greet us again. Things that we held maybe not completely unconsciously but in a subconscious place where we knew they were there but we just never went back to meet them. And then 
something happens and the ice of that forgetting melts and all of those memories are available to us again. And it happened to my mother around that age and it happened to me around this age that traumas from childhood, just bad things that happen, sometimes joyful things that we'd set aside, thought they were unimportant, but then they come back with this huge feeling of, of importance around them. Just arrive again. And, and so the second section of this book is about how I realized as I was writing about these bodies, why was I so fascinated with these, these animal bodies? It was because I was recognizing myself in all of those ancient bodies. I could see that I also had an infant self that would come and and, and greet the world now and then. And I also had an adolescent self that would come and react to something and believe that this was really the real world, that, they, that nothing had ever changed, that that adolescent world is, is, is still all around them. So this, this recognition that I had was, was very deep and abiding, and I started to write these poems about the frozen animals, but I couldn't help but returning to my own animals. So this poem is called Reading the Light Surrounding the Lark. And the epigraph for this one comes from CNN. Buried and frozen in permafrost near the village of Balaya Gora in northeastern Siberia, the bird was discovered by local fossil ivory hunters. Radiocarbon dating revealed the bird lived around 46,000 years ago, and genetic analysis identified it as a horned lark. So again, the, the title of this is Reading the Light Surrounding the Lark. What you're witnessing is not merely residue of ice. They chiseled, they chiseled it apart by toothbrush. For the permafrost had coated it like plaque, but it was not a tooth. It was not rotten. It was perched underground in its negative tree. It was a lark, and it has always been a lark. Then the underground cloud cracked, melted, and the lark fell upward to our world. To read the light around the lark, imagine you have chiseled part of you away, an old part at the beginning of a succession of your childhood bodies. You fall upward from your previous body out of the melting ice. And when you look back on each body, if you will brush them carefully, if you will chisel what is not you carefully, you will know that each is still bewildered and desiring to stay in what it must believe is the only world, the one that's safe, the real one. So when my, <clears throat> when my father was dying, I, I got to be with him up to the last moment. And there was a period following his death when I went up into the attic and pulled out these boxes of treasured items of his from the years before he was married. And there wasn't that much. There was one box, and it had a few things in it, some pictures from childhood, some awards that he won, and it had his Navy yearbook, which was the was kind of the, the commemorative book uh, for the, the, the finishing of boot camp, I guess. And it had pictures of all of you know, his buddies in there. And, and there were pictures of him at 19 in the book. And I opened it randomly to the middle. And there, <laughs> on this random page, Circled in red was the word possess. 
So circled in red, and the book was brand new. It smelled new. When you opened it up, it was like he hadn't opened it since 1955. But this book possess, or this word possess was, was circled in red, which is very strange. <laughs> I knew you'd like that. <laughs> very strange. Why did he do that? I don't even know if it was him, granted. I, I couldn't at that point ask him, but who else would it have been? It wasn't misspelled, and it didn't have any kind of contextual meaning anywhere else. It was just circled in red, possess. So thinking about that for years, I finally came to a poem. And what I noticed about the poems, all of the poems in this book, is that there is some kind of there animality quality to even the words that, that I'm writing about. So this, this poem is called Possess. Just when the rain opened up, just now when I heard it like radio static, getting louder on the roof, I thought of how the confusions will be all I may remember in my life. A few moments of bewilderment in which I knew what being wild meant. Mounting to the volta, the bolt of lightning, and of how I found my father's Navy yearbook among his best things in the closet and opening it to a page at random, I saw he had circled in red the word possess and wondered, did he think it was misspelled or did he want me to know his mind was taken at the end and his body and it was not him saying and doing and doing and saying things? Or did he mean it as a command to possess myself as I have not yet come to do? Or did he mean something else I do not understand yet? The red circle in an oval around the egg of light and the word all soft bones inside. So <clears throat> along with those poems about remembering and the poems about words and, and, and words as bodies, memories as bodies, I realized as I was writing through this collection that I had to find a way of, of resolving all of that. I wanted to somehow thread them all together. And so I began to ask myself, well, what is it really? What, what were those things that that melted the ice of forgetting that I was describing. What, what are those things for you all? What are they for anyone? Sometimes they're general. They're just love, family, friends, uh, people who push your buttons and who get inside you and you know who, who force you to unravel that way. For me, yes, all those things. But there was also something else and it was the, the light of poetry. If it wasn't for the study of poetry all these years, having to teach it and having to have something to say about it, and also having to write it and having to listen to what it had to say to me. If it wasn't for the light of poetry, uh, I don't think I would have come to those understandings. So my... Um, the inevitable end of this book has to do with reading poets in the places where they, they wrote their poems. So I'll just read a, a, a few of those. Um, where should I start? Well, I guess I'll start here. 24 years ago, I was uh, blessed to have won a, a literary prize that was judged by Mary Oliver. And I remember being in my little apartment in Philadelphia thinking about whether I, whether I wanted to continue teaching and writing. I mean, I was really in that place in my life. And my book had been floating around out there for about three years, and I was an adjunct teaching six or seven classes a semester. I mean, that'll teach you how to teach. But I was in my apartment, and it was around New Year's Day, 1999, 
and I got a call from this university press that said, congratulations, uh, we're going to publish your book, you won this prize. And, and I said, oh, that's, a, that's amazing, and, and who was the judge? And they said, the judge was Mary Oliver. And I remember thinking to myself, how strange that there are two Mary Olivers, <laughs> that <laughs> this could not possibly be the same Mary Oliver that I'm thinking of. Um, the Mary Oliver or a Mary Oliver? The. So it was the Mary Oliver who had judged the book, and I was so grateful that I wanted to write her a letter and sent it to the publisher to send to her, and she wrote me back, and we started a, a wonderful correspondence that went on for six or seven years before I finally got to spend some time with her. I did meet her at one point in the middle there, but I got to spend some quality time with her uh, up in Cape Cod where she lived for 50 years. And I was driving up there for the first visit. She had given me her address, which was on Commercial Street. And I had the piece of paper in my pocket, not looking at it. I just went to Commercial Street. And in, in my mind, I had something like, and I'm not sure if this is the actual address, but I had something like 500 Commercial Street in my mind. And my, my GPS took me there. And I pulled over and walked up to this beautiful house. Mary Oliver lives here. I knocked on the door <laughs> and someone answered and looked at me kind of confused and, and I said, is this Mary Oliver's house? And the person at the door said, no, this is Stanley Kunis's house. <laughs> and just by just by accident and I explained what had happened and she could not get over that and said you have to come in and so she invited me in and Stanley Kunis had just died it was it was 2007 so in the last couple of years uh, we had lost him and these were people who were in the house and who were um, uh, you know still tending it and closing it down and so she invited me back into uh, Stanley Kunitz's garden. He was a master gardener and uh, offered me a little, she, pl she plucked a, a, a hollyhock and gave it to me. And it was still partially closed. And if you know uh, Stanley Kunitz and his work, you know that he loved hollyhocks, that he had a special affection for them. So th that story, that long story is the, the prelude to this short poem called A Hollyhock That Once Belonged to Stanley Kunitz. Later that week, I found it in my right side pocket. It had begun to bloom, blue, tissue thin. To the bottle of carbolic acid went your father. To brain plaque, the weed of forgetfulness went your mother. Still you felt a fondness for the natural thing. You loved even the mulch and the flower of the Mallow family, hollyhock. Come in, you said. From one specimen of the garden, you cut me a sprig, which I pocketed, taken from light, from you, from its princedom, a small gautama. Then I forgot it was there, down there in the dark, doing its precise work anyway. So Mary and I were <clears throat> friends for about 20 years. And it was really the gift of my life. And on one of those visits up to the Cape, I noticed that she had an oar hanging in her living room above the couch. And I asked her about it. She said, oh, that oar has been hanging there for 25 years. Why don't you, why don't you take it home with you? <laughs> and, and, and how could I say no? I climbed up onto the couch. I took it off of the, the brackets. And, uh, and I, I drove home with it. And I still have it in my, in my study. But it's such... It, it's such a beautiful metaphor also for, for what poetry has been. Uh, I don't know if, if poetry is the water. I don't know if poetry is the boat. Uh, 
I have a sense that poetry is certainly the oar that I can place in the water now and then and steer my way uh, along with. So this poem is for Mary and it's called The Oar. It's in, it's in three parts. It was what you gave me, spattered with white paint on the flat end, stripped of its finish by the gunwale on the other. So I took it home that summer and stood it in the corner of my study. I wonder if it would be enough to carry me in my boat where I lost on the river or the bay. I would be carried anyway, you might have said. You knew how waves carry little boats despite their plans. <clears throat> Things travel forward when there's nothing to impede them. Things travel forward also when there is against the smack of the current a voice, an oar to make a difference. So many stories begin with rage. Then you know it will be a long story. And when it's long, it will have to move slowly. I'm not making this up. It's just a fact, like it was for Achilles and Medea, or the way you talked about Tecumseh. You should have begun with rage, but instead you left it to your people. You lived a long time away. What do I call the force that propelled your work now that there's no mass to carry it? I'd call it wonder, but no, not that, not merely wide-eyed heartfulness. You bent down to things, hard-headed, squinting, wanting to see. I'm not amazed it has continued on without you. Another day, and I'm amazed that I'm still here, writing things down. You were old, and I was young when I met you. You said, while standing in the kitchen, making coffee, not counting how many spoons the universe had to be, but it didn't have to be beautiful. The week you died, a deer in winter stepped out of the woods here, watching me watch her on the grass next to the road. It was dark. That was back in January. No headlights on the road. Nothing. At least in the way the world calls action appeared to be happening. So another great love and great influence in my life is Emily Dickinson. And this is one of those poems I was describing where I'm writing about reading the poet in the place where they wrote their poetry. It's called Reading Emily Dickinson in Amherst, Massachusetts. I know how it feels to live in a small leaden room with only snakes and birds as consolation. I know how to imagine death by falling through stories of floorboards, like a poem flutters through molecules, air, and time. It never lands in the yard. The trick is not to die while dreaming of death. That's why the circle of doors and windows here remain open a little. That's why the poems seem often to end on slant rhymes and dashes. That's why the hawthorn cone is never quite in full bloom, but almost. I too come here respectfully. I bow halfway at thresholds. I know how to wait at a completely empty window, holding out my hands. My mother reading Dickinson at the end. She didn't call her Emily or Miss Emily like almost everyone who disrespected her, but this person. My mother said she was beginning to get an idea where the horse's heads were turning. The plumbing needed work, the roof leaked. There'd been a sudden change for the worse, of course, 
in her disappearing body and in every corridor of that house. My mother lay in her bed upstairs with her hands on her chest. The book was open, face down on the table by the lamp, like a sunbather. This person knew how to live between the ticking of the clock, she said. My mother coughed again, little dashes in her sentences. Much of that time, in fact, her sleep was interposed with dashes. Holes and tubes coursed out into November and the night. So I'll just read one more poem, and then I'm told that we have some time for conversation, which I would love. So this is, this is a poem called Is, and it's the bookend to the first poem called Ice. And I, I do think that the melting away of those frozen bodies or the lifting them up into consciousness and awareness really is about welcoming it all in. And it's about the presence, the isness, whatever you want to call it, in whatever language you, whatever spiritual language you speak. Uh, and so this is a poem that is kind of an homage to the word is and its travels from antiquity to the present. And the epigraph here is from a 13th century manuscript written by one monk to another monk anonymously, uh, and it's called The Cloud of Unknowing. So here's, here's the line. For there is no name, no experience, and no insight so akin to everlastingness than this word is. Now that I see its gorgeous consolations, its hard math, its equal sign that conjures metaphor of anything, I know the long life of the word, transplanted into other tongues, its cognates disseminated like eyes, and I love the rhyme surprise. Let there come a calm agreement among strangers saying nothing, riding in a train. This is. Let there come the apodictic hush of Essa. There is an order that demands I change. Now, nevertheless, whatever is will be frozen as a photograph. It survives from yom to am freckled like the egg in each retelling, each iteration, each unique, a Buddhist smile, each syllable an iron nail. I know the troubles of the word, its passive accusations, mistakes were made, how is and was are the first sparring gods. But it has priestesses and priests. Beloved, you are one and I am one. Let curiosity be prayer. Let being be the rebel that I frond and crucify and come to life again, lest I be quiet. I rub ashes on my body. I steal fire. I give you fire. I lower my head. Thanks, everybody. We have we have a microphone over here for for questions. Dave, uh, I wanted to ask you about Ethelbert. about epigraphs. Because yeah. um, are there times when the epigraph gives birth to the poem, or is the epigraph added like seasoning after the poem has been completed? <laughs> <laughs> that th that is usually it's the seasoning for me. That's a great question because uh, in this case it was not seasoning. It was reading those articles, extracting a line or two, and then starting the poem from there. So, and I also felt that it was important that there was some uh, dynamic between the news and the eternal, frozen, never-changing thing that I was describing in the poem. So the epigraph was serving also as, a, as like a, a running headline underneath the, the still photograph. Nice, thank you. 
at what age did you start uh, writing poetry, and have you uh, also written things other than poetry, uh, fiction and nonfiction, and how is the process different? Well, thank you. I started writing poetry rather late. I think I was 18, 19 when I started. I was writing music before that, uh, and I have I have pursued music in, in a minor way. I, I wrote and produced an album about 12 years ago. So that would be the other genre that uh, for me is, is extremely important. But poetry has always you know, had the most emphasis on my, my writing life. I don't write much else in, in other genres. Uh, I know that a lot of poets write nonfiction, and I, I have written and published essays, but nothing significant. For me, it's always been poetry. Poetry has been the alpha and omega for me. And, uh, and you know, and I would like to, I would like to experiment with other genres, but frankly, it doesn't work out that well when I try. <laughs> so I always go back to what's working. Aaron. Thank you for your beautiful poetry. So you compared the thawing of the Arctic permafrost to middle age and the awakening of uh, childhood memories in middle age. But when you were talking about Dogor, you also said that he framed history, that he mm. was there at the beginning yeah. and there at the end. So I guess my question to you is, is the Anthropocene humanity's middle age or is it humanity's death? Oh boy. <laughs> Feel free to answer in poetry. <laughs> <laughs> you know, what does, a, what does a poet know about, about the future? If anything, a poet knows more about the present than anything, anything else we could talk about. Uh, I, I would say that where Dogor is concerned, the predominant word that comes to mind is love, joy, playfulness, all of the things that we associate with puppydom that uh, I'm, I'm equating with the values of the heart in that poem. You know, it's, 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 not, a, it's not a book or, a, or specifically a poem that's trying to um, make a statement about what might happen next. I actually have another book where I, I tried to do that called The World to Come. Uh, it came out a, a couple of years ago. And, you know, and even that was an imaginative leap. But this is, this is more of a reconciliation of, the, of what future m might be with the past that was into, into the present. And if any of the poems were successful, it was in the way that they tried to hold those, those three conditions uh, in one gesture. So that's the best I can do. In your writing, and especially in your editing, how do you know when your, a poem is finished? Or does it just tell you? <laughs> there are those that say a poem is never finished. Often. People say a poem is finished when it's published, but I've gone back and revised poems that were already in books before. So my, I guess I, I, I lean toward the never finished um, camp, but I, I do think that when a poem is finished, there is something has happened there where it's begun to, to talk to you in a way that's surprising even you. I was, I was in office hours with a student a couple days ago, and I was talking about that feeling of, of finishing a poem or a poem coming to a landing at the end. And it's something like the inevitable conclusion to the thing that I never would have expected. And that feeling of the inevitable is definitely part of knowing that the poem is, has come to an end. So when I, when I achieve that moment, I know that I'm there. Who else? Ah, Barbara Goldberg. Uh, 
I always say I know when a poem is finished when it stops itching. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, do you know the Galway Canal book, uh, When One Has Lived a Long Time Alone? Yes. Okay, so there's a poem in there that has three is's is in a row. <clears throat> and it goes, um, it go, it's the end of a poem, and it says, whatever is, is, is what I want. Mm. Not that, but just, uh, just that, but that, or whatever. So anyway, I wanted to do one better, so I have one with three, maybe four is, as I forget. So I guess I know your professor, but this is your assignment. <laughs> At least three is's in a row. Okay? <laughs> Sound good? Okay. I'll work on that. <laughs> Thanks, Barbara. Bonnie. So I would just like to ask you about one particular poem in this book, which is um, reading Gilgamesh before falling asleep. Mm -hmm. And I'm really interested in what was going through your mind as you were reading it, and to what extent did falling asleep while you were reading it, or before you were reading it, um, uh, influence how you wrote the poem? The poem that Bonnie is asking about is a, a, an imaginative journey between myself and my my dog Molly where I'm playing Gilgamesh and Molly is playing Enkidu Gilgamesh's sidekick and you had to be there when <laughs> when that one came to be but my my dog Molly died 10 years ago and uh, and I'm still in conversation with with Molly and dogs do take up a big part of this book dogs and wolves take up a big part of this this book. So um, your question is, how did that come to be? Um, so I'm interested in, in the fact that you're, re you're reading Gilgamesh, um, which is the oldest story known, um, while falling asleep. And I'm wondering about the process of falling asleep and what that has, how that affects uh, your um, your taking in of the, of what you're reading, how it resides with you. Well, yes. So I, I I think the the ways that falling asleep incorporates that thing on the outside, the story, mm -hmm. and and personalizes it and weaves it into your own story is is what you're getting at. And that did that did happen. I don't know if it happened exactly that way. Mm -hmm. uh, for the sake of the poem, it did, but it, it would happen that way anyway. Whenever I'm writing a poem, I'm always kind of half asleep when I'm when I'm writing a poem. I'm, it's like a conscious dreaming, not mm -hmm. completely asleep, but just distracted enough so that distracted away from the world enough so that something else can come in. And in that case, it was the joining together of my story with Molly, which might be seen as like something trite or nostalgic, mm -hmm. but paired with Gilgamesh and Enkidu had a kind of strange, um, I don't know, sparkly quality to it. So that's where that came Thank from. Thank you. Yeah. Anybody else? Oh, hey. I know this is uh, an event about poetry, but you mentioned that you produced an album about 12 years ago. Yeah. Um, if you don't mind sharing, what genre of music was that that you produced, and is it available? Uh, yes. For folks? It, yeah. the, the album is called By and By, and it is Roots Music. Uh, it was uh, a project that I undertook when I discovered the 160-year-old copy books of my great-great-grandfather who fought in the Civil War and in those copy books were poems that other people had inscribed in it and some songs and poems that he had written and so I wanted to collaborate with the dead and I made an album uh, based on those songs in fact 
they're absolutely his lyrics, and I wrote the music, and uh, we produced the album together in our in our way about 12 years ago. Uh, so, and here in DC. Wow, that's beautiful. Yeah, it was a, it was a great project. Yeah. Nice, thank you. Thanks, thanks for that question. Very lucky to have that CD to bop to in my car. Thank you All for right. the gift. The, um, <laughs> I sold. I guess I sold one at least. You gave it to me for free, David. <laughs> A beautiful gift. I love it. Thank you. Thank you, Caroline. <laughs> I bought the book. So, <laughs> um, a question about form. Yes. I'm wondering how you approached writing about ice through form. I saw that you're using some big blocks, and then you chunk off into sections, and then other parts get a little more erratic with interesting line breaks and indentations. Did that um, mean to signal melting or chipping away? How did mm -hmm. form reveal itself to you as you were writing about frozen things? Uh, I'm really glad you asked that question because Majda Gama, who was um, interviewing me and reading alongside me um, at the Ivy last month, was asking me after the event about a poem that was called Guzzle, which was just a paragraph. And in a way, that paragraph called Guzzle has a guzzle inside it, but it's stuck in this block and I was doing that all throughout the book and so what you've done with that question is forced me to reveal the <laughs> the, the secret uh, coding that I that I put into the book and if you look closely I think you'll find that in every poem there is either a, a line that's alluding to another poet or a form that's trapped inside something that doesn't look like that form. Uh, I wanted each poem to be like a block of ice with something alive in it. Yeah. So that's that is uh, that's a, the question I was hoping someone would ask. What Thank you. Means. Thank you, Caroline. Mashta. I was going to ask about the Ghazal again, so I'm, you preempted me. But I, I had a question that I wanted to ask you at the Ivy about the uh, the poem, The Puppet Tiger, that masculinity is. Um, I, As long as I've been reading you for about 10 years now, I don't think of you as a political poet, but I thought that this was the most political you've ever been. It is also a p very personal and a beautiful poem full of lineage. Of, of poets you admire, but I was wondering about that title and and that poem, if you could speak a little bit about that. Well, it's a really short poem, so I'll, I'll read that. Yes, um, please. <clears throat> the puppet tiger that masculinity is. When I say tiger, I mean the catatonic one of William Blake its roar stalled while rising between the diaphragm and the uvula. Or I could mean my Daniel, the flattened, ineffectual puppet tiger of my childhood. He seemed to lack a mandible. The voice spoke feebly from outside his body. My father's name was Daniel. His father's name was Daniel. In the neighborhood of make-believe, they all set out to find Blake's tiger once and for all. It takes them exactly the length of my life until they come across it among leaves falling in their 18th century cursive across the sky. <clears throat> so there are two tigers in the, in the poem. One is a puppet tiger, and the other is Blake's tiger, which in my reading of of that poem and of that image is the fulfillment of one's uh, primal joy and living the life that one is, living the life that's determined by one's own choices. The, there's the tiger and there's the lamb. If the tiger is pressed down, then um, it will come out ferociously later if the lamb is pressed down, then you know the, the 
the compassionate side of life disappears and dissolves. So this poem about the tiger is me trying to figure out what it means to be a man in the world in this line of, of Daniels behind me. I was deliberately not named Daniel, I was told, because all of the Daniels before me um, had some unlucky quality to their life. So there was that that came into the poem as well. But I do think that there is the, there's the puppet man, and then there's the, the man who can live by the conditions of his own choosing. And I guess I'm trying to navigate that in this short little poem. Well, there's no other questions. Thank you, David, for being with us here today. Thanks, everyone. <clears throat> Can I just say thank you all. I, I'm just so lucky to have you all here today. Uh, I, I know about 80% of the people in the audience, and, uh, and I'm just really blessed to be, um, to be able to stand here in this community and, and read my poems and, and to be supported by you all in this way over many, many years. Uh, so I'm just very grateful. Thank you all.